We are so pleased to welcome you to this episode of Transformational Leadership in a Turbulent Time, part of the Transformational Leadership series at Yale Divinity School, in which we're exploring what leadership looks like in a time such as this with theologically educated leaders who are walking with us into this new day. We hope that you'll take the opportunity to watch other programs in this series, including conversations with Dr. Elijah Hayward of the International African American Museum in Charleston, South Carolina, Ashley McCarr, community liaison with the Integrated Refugee and Immigrant Services in New Haven, and Reverend Ben Groth, the pastor of Bethlehem Lutheran Church in New Orleans. The final event in this series will be a live Zoom conversation with Bishop William Barber, the visionary proclaimer of justice who leads the national effort, Repairers of the Breach, and the new Poor People's Campaign. That program will be aired live on Sunday evening, November 15th. You can register for that event on the same Yale Divinity School website that brought you to us this evening. Now we are delighted to turn to tonight's guest, Ryan Lerner. Father Ryan Lerner holds a BA in History and Religion from Trinity College in Hartford and an MA in Public Policy. After a career in health care administration, Father Ryan responded to a call to the priesthood, studying next at St. Joseph's Seminary in Yonkers and then at the Catholic University in Washington, DC. A native of Manchester, Connecticut, a marathon runner, a warm and engaging pastor, Father Ryan is now both the Chancellor of the Archdiocese of Hartford and since 2019, the Roman Catholic Chaplain at Yale University. Interviewing Father Ryan will be Chris Gurley, a second year Master of Arts in Religion student at Yale Divinity School. Chris, a Roman Catholic and a native of Chattanooga, Tennessee, holds a Master's of Theological Study from Vanderbilt and a Bachelor's Degree from Tennessee State University. Chris Gurley and Father Ryan Lerner, Welcome. Thank you, Bill. Thank you. Happy to be here. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Well, good afternoon, Father Ryan. I just want to first say um, that we appreciate for you um, to come here and to speak today. Um, plus, it is an honor just to speak with you in, gen in general as a mentor and a friend. So thank you, Father Ryan. Chris, I'm yeah. delighted with you today and uh and, and it's, it's an honor of course to speak with you and i enjoy our conversation so looking forward to this one uh this afternoon so thank you great Happy awesome um so i so i would like to start off this evening with a question about your vocation and your work within the archdiocese um because i'm curious um what led you to the priesthood and i know you that you were are many hats. And so I'm just curious if you could tell us a tad bit about that. Sure. All right. Um, I'm gonna try, I'll try to keep it as short as possible, Chris, but I would say I begin with the fact that my twin sister and I um, both converted to Catholicism. We were about 12 years old. Um, we were raised, uh, my dad was Jewish, mom was Catholic. We went into Catholic grade school, though, for the education, not necessarily the faith formation. Um, but growing up, kind of learning with an open slate, you know, parents are like, let them figure out for themselves. And it kind of worked in an interesting way. Um, so learning about the faith, learning about Jesus and um, being surrounded in a very Catholic milieu and the Sisters of Mercy to take a chunk of my vocation to the Sisters of Mercy. Awesome. Um, but when we were about 12 years old, we decided to become Catholic. And that's when kind of uh, I, I'd say at that point, you know, we took responsibility for the practice of our faith in that sense. Um, after going from a small Catholic high school to a huge public to a huge public high school, um, realizing how important it was to to have faith, to believe in God, to have hope. You know, yesterday's reading from St. Paul talked about those without hope and without God. Um, and what a gift it is to be able to, to have the gift of faith and to be able to express it around others. Um, you know, so throughout high school, kind of grew in the faith in that sense, um, went into Trinity College, small New England liberal arts college, really enjoyed the college thing. And I would say I experienced the similar challenges to faith that typical college students have, just kind of preoccupied with a ton of other things, you know, running and theater and class and double majors and all that. But also at the same time, went to college during the time of September 11th, the September of the 9-11 um, events, and also the pre-sex abuse crisis, the first major manifestation of that um, in Boston in 2002. Um, so tested challenge in my faith like so many others and for whatever reason like as many had left 
I considered leaving, but I stayed. Um, and, and that choice alone in the light of you know, the help of the Holy Spirit, for whatever reason, I stayed in the church, even though I struggled um, with, with the church at that time, as so many other Catholics did with that betrayal of trust and, and crisis in leadership. Um, thankfully, I, continue, I stayed, for, again, for whatever reason. Um, after college, uh, you know, uh, drifted in and out of church in the sense of my practice of the faith. Um, and then after college, coached for a couple of years, cross country and track while doing a master's in public policy. Um, considered going that route in life. You know, there were always relationships, thought I, I assumed I would be eventually, you know, be married and have a family one day. Um, whenever I thought about being a priest, that kind of little, you know, nudge from the Holy Spirit, perhaps, you know, you meet certain people, encounters with certain people, people, particularly um, from my brothers and sisters in the, in the poor community. Um, you'd meet these people from time to time or these little interactions or coincidences, but there are no coincidences with God, right? You know, God has a plan. Um, but occasionally when I would think about being a priest, that would, it would give me a sense of, you know, fulfillment and joy. But at the same time, the idea of celibacy was kind of a big turnoff in a sense. Didn't yeah. really, wasn't sure about that calling. Um, but, you know, God has a way, you know, again, kind of bringing us back to church for various things or bringing, entering into our lives. Jesus, you know, is present to us in our, brothers and sisters and our neighbors, especially those in need. Um, after coaching for a couple of years, I ended up going to work for my father's company as a nursing home administrator. And I would say at that time, that's when, uh, you know, when, you're, when your license is on the wall and you're responsible for the lives of 90 folks, 90 people um, who are in various stages of recuperation or who are sick or, um, you know, in need of healing or preparing for death, you know, as well as their caregivers, you know, nurses are some of the most amazing people, you know, angels among us in a sense, I would say. Yes. Um, and recognizing the presence of God and, and the power of Jesus Christ, even in that setting. Um, at the end of the day, I would find myself going home and thinking about these people who are entrusted to my care and those whom I'm responsible for as administrator, um, but also encountering in them the presence of, of Christ. And I would say at that point, my, my prayer life kind of had a little bit more depth because I was probably more focused on others in such, a, such an intense way. And for whatever reason, during a crazy week, um, I thought, gosh, am I really doing what I want to be doing <laughs> with my life? Yes. I like the work. Um, the, the, the salary was good, you know, on a decent path. Um, but am I really doing what I want to be doing with my life? Am I really doing what I should be doing? And then looking back, the real question was, am I really doing what God wants me to do? Yes. Um, and uh, just kind of Googled priesthood, Connecticut, and found the Archdiocese of Hartford website. The director of vocations at the time was a very down-to-earth, cool priest, if you will, who was uh, at Trinity when I was coaching, not when I was undergrad, and thought, here's someone I can talk to in a candid way and just kind of lay out my life, you know, the good, the bad, the ugly, um, and kind of, you know, is someone like me, would someone like me really be, you know, someone that, that could be a priest? And it turned out, you know, gave me the application. The answer was yes. You know, God takes, you know, yes. God takes a chance on all of us, despite our, you know, our, yes. our brokenness and, and all of that. Uh, so that application sat in the drawer for about six months, uh, lingering on the, around the question, why do you think God is calling you to be a priest? And ultimately, you know, looking back on life and, and through the lens of faith and thinking, you know, wow, yeah, God was there in so many ways because God is present in everything. Again, in, in, in times of joy, in times of, you know, when we're drifting, when we're struggling, God is always present and realizing, yeah, God was entering into my life in the person of Jesus Christ, in the person of those around me and kind of nudging me towards this direction. So I entered the seminary, completed that application, entered the seminary, and um, and I stayed, you know, throughout six awesome. years. <laughs> formation is about discerning and is really what God wants. And then your, your vocation is entrusted to those, you know, to spiritual directors and there's academic formation, human formation. And um, with those entrusted with vocations in the church year to year, well, throughout six years, I stayed. Um, there were moments of, you know, doubt questions, but I stayed and ultimately was, was ordained in 2014. And now I'm six years a priest. Uh, after a year of parish priesthood, I was appointed, you know, now with the shortage of priests. So yes. you end up getting multiple jobs in some ways. <laughs> um, yes. After a year, a year of working in the parish, I was appointed to be the Archbishop's secretary. Um, and, and that's when I tell people about being the Archbishop's secretary, whatever the word secretary brings to mind with a lowercase and an uppercase. So I keep the calendar. I make sure there's gas in the car. 
um, you know, prepare the Archbishop's notes for him from time to time, but I'm also on his cabinet as an advisor in a sense. Um, and uh, then was appointed chancellor shortly after that, um, basically working with marriage paperwork and, and some of the issues, you know, a lot of responsible for archives and records and things. That's what goes with the chancellor position. Uh, and probably one of the most important roles I've had as chancellor is presiding over the research that went into putting together our list of uh, priests with credible allegations of abuse against them. After the Pennsylvania grand jury report um, and this latest manifestation of the sex abuse crisis and crisis in, in leadership and accountability in the church, all the dioceses throughout the country were preparing lists of credibly accused priests and then putting, sharing these with the public. Um, so that was I presided over that work to present that list. Um, and right now still as chancellor, an independent uh, law review team is, is reviewing our work um, and then preparing for that, the announcement of that report probably later in this year. Um, okay. And of course at that time was released from the job as the Archbishop's secretary and became the chaplain of St. Thomas More here at Yale University, which is awesome. awesome. Yeah, great to be with the people and I continue to be inspired by our students, but in a particular way with the way that they've moved through this time with such grace and perseverance um, with all of the all the challenges that we're all facing, you know, both in the world and in the church these days. So, yes, probably a long response to your question there, but that's. Oh, <laughs> no, Father Ryan, I really do appreciate you giving that answer because your experience represents the ex the experience of so many young people who are trying to discern and just figure out what God is calling them to do. And for most of us, we kind of think that God calls us at six and we know that we're, this is what we're called to do. But you gave us a story of growth and the work that God puts us in. So I really do appreciate you just being honest. Um, that kind of leads me into the question of, since you just gave us a story of the world that we kind of all lived in prior to COVID, I was wondering if you could give us your opinion about the vision of the church and Catholicism with COVID and post-COVID. Um, could you tell us about the creative measures that you took the transition St. Thomas More into this new world? Um, and as a priest, what did it mean for you to find a way or to figure out how to minister within this life? Um, were people resistant? Were they more welcome to it? Could you just tell me your experiences with that? Sure. So it kind of leading right up to right up to COVID, I kind of gave a little bit of a snapshot of, of of the church, the state of the church in a sense, right? Um, universal Roman Catholic Church. You know, we are the body of Christ throughout the world. That's our, our understanding, but also recognizing um, that a, the church in many ways, you know, being challenged with with changes in culture and uh, and signs of the times, um, trying to preach the gospel in a way that resonates with people where they're at, um, who they are, and with what's with all the questions that our culture is posing. And sometimes um, having to learn and, and find the vocabulary with which to, you know, uh, bear witness to the gospel, to convey the church's teachings um, in a way that is that is truthful and, and loving and all embracing, but also open to the movements of the Holy Spirit, even when the Holy Spirit is challenging us to to enter into sometimes at first uncomfortable places, um, you know, and, and when, when, especially when we're, we're, we're challenged with the, with the questions people are facing in their lives and, and their loved ones. Um, going into COVID, I would say, you know, church kind of moving along, um, you know, the, in the latest manifestation of the crisis in 2016 to 2018 and sorting that out. Um, and, but for the most part, people going to mass, uh, you know, people who are practicing their faith are on, they're in, um, despite the challenges, amidst the challenges, but at the same time, obviously, in many ways, hemorrhaging people, especially young people, um, especially, you know, especially young adults. We have to acknowledge the fact that due to really our failings, uh, you know, as a church, and also sometimes to respond uh, to, to people's needs and the challenges of the time with, with the right language and, and, you know, again, the truth and love, um, really losing almost a generation of people. Right, right around my age, you know, 39 to 50 years old, right, and their children. Um, but those who are in are in, and 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 they're there. Then COVID happens, <laughs> and suddenly, you know, the things that we tend to take for granted, you know, um, our our worship, our being together, 
um, with all of our bumps and bruises, with all of the blessings and beauty of the body of Christ, but all also with our struggles, um, coming together, worshiping together, um, sharing this journey together, suddenly, you know, having to close our doors and, and at a time when the church is needed the most, when the sacraments are needed the most, where grace is needed the most, um, manifestations of the works of mercy, Christ's presence among the people, suddenly we're being told, and, 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 and I have accepted this, to, to, be a, to be a good Christian, to bear witness to the presence of Jesus Christ also means making responsible decisions to protect your flock. Um, and if that means that we do not get to go into the hospitals when people are needing the sacraments, um, finding creative ways to work with those who are there, you know, you know, on the front lines, if you will, you know, um, and with families you know, during this time of struggle to keep the faith. You know, we cling to a hope, as I say, as St. Paul tells us, to a hope that does not disappoint. Um, yes. You know, the church is the world has, has experienced pandemics before and, and times of extreme, you know, uh, darkness and and you know we have we have persevered because we believe that we are in jesus christ who has won the victory right but immediately when we had to close our doors um we were immediately impacted by the covid crisis as one of a member of our community um was one of the first to become sick here in new haven um so we had to actually close our doors about two weeks ahead of the archdiocese of hartford we were lucky to have the resources to be able to just kind of flip a switch, if you will, and have a live stream liturgy. So we were immediately able to take all of our programming, all of our small groups, our faith sharing, um, our celebration of the mass and put it into a virtual format. Um, and at first, March, April, May, that seemed to be nourishing for people. We still continue to have a pretty decent following people attending the live stream mass. Um, but you know, Zoom fatigue is real, so. <laughs> yes. <laughs> You know, so virtual faith sharing or, or retreats, um, consultations, you know, pastoral check-ins. We're still doing these, but we do find, you know, especially with students who are, you know, probably on Zoom, in Zoom classrooms for 9, 10, 12, you know, how many hours a day. Um, yes. To be able to, you know, come together and pray over Zoom is not always helpful. So we have to continue to be present to what our students' needs are. We just released a survey this week among all of our students basically saying, hey, how are you doing? If this is the reality that we're going to be in for the foreseeable future, how do we best serve you? What do you need from us? Um, how do we as Christians, all of us, you know, you know, all of us bear witness to, you know, the love, the joy of the gospel, the power of Jesus Christ, even in difficult times. So that's been the challenge. That's what we're preaching um, and trying to move through this as a body, as the body of Christ. One thing that Zoom has taught us or, or the virtual realm has taught us that the body of Christ cannot be... Uh, you know, it, it can't be hindered um, or, or held back by physical barriers. You know, we, we span throughout the whole world. I think the Holy Father, you know, standing in an empty Vatican Square in the rain, in the darkness, and, and blessing the world with the Eucharist, you know, that was a real blessing. It was meant for the yes, world. It was meant a moment of reconciliation, of mercy, um, of inspiration. And I think we, we all, as Catholics, we experienced that and it's kind of reminded us, yeah, that's real. That's Christ crossing every barrier, you know? Um, so that's been kind of an inspiring thing to, to return to, but when you're going on <laughs> the end of October and time just kind of moving along in this 2020th year of our Lord, <laughs> um, <laughs> it's, uh, it can be challenging, you know, but, uh, that leads into my, my next question, um, for you as a priest and just for like you as a pastor, um, what does this world mean in terms of the sacramental life of of the church or the loss of a sacramental life? And for you, which I was just curious, what was it like to celebrate a mass with an empty church in an empty church, rather? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Because I'm gonna, you're gonna see me cry now. No, um, oh, it's, no, no. It's it's obviously you know that's one thing. I think one of those things we sort of take it, take it for granted. <laughs> you know, a lot of us when we think about our relationship with God, it's like me and God, um, and it's it's not about it's about God. You know, love of God and love of neighbor, right? The great commandment, going all the way back to the book of Deuteronomy. It's never just about me and God. It's important to have a personal relationship with God, but it's never just me and God. And that's, you know, and we'll I'll put that out there and maybe we'll talk about this part of our part of our time together. But 
it, that requires us always to be present to our, our, our brothers and sisters, our neighbor, whoever's in need, whoever's in our midst, you know, bearing the presence of God. Um, but yeah, so what we do is communal. We come together as the body of Christ to receive the body of Christ in Jesus's body and blood sacramentally. So it's, it's communal, it's physical, um, celebrating the, 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 the Lord's Supper, the, the Paschal mystery in Jesus Christ means coming together as the body of Christ, being together and receiving Jesus together. Um, we eat, we drink, we shake hands, we sing, you know, we embrace all yes. of these things that you're not supposed to do. <laughs> it's also just a thing, right? Yes. So it's challenged us to, to think, again, what does it mean to be the body of Christ? What does it mean to engage in what is called spiritual communion? Um, to, you know, direct our hearts, our minds, our conscience, to encounter the living God, to engage in communion, even when we are not receiving it physically. Yes. Um, that's a great challenge, in it, but it's also, you know, been a, it's been an invitation to meditation, deeper prayer. What does it mean to both receive Jesus in the Eucharist, but also to be a Eucharistic people made you know, to be sacrificed, to be, to be, you know, given to others as nourishment. And now it's a spiritual nourishment. It's a different sense. It's always there. It's a whole part of our celebration. I think we're not always aware about, aware of this time has challenged us to think more about what it means to not only receive the Eucharist, but to be Eucharistic to others, you know? Um, yeah. As a priest of, with, for all of those things that I just said, the whole communal nature, you know, when we come together for mass, it's the priest and the person of Jesus as the head, if they say, in union with his body and bride, the church. You know, when I make my promises to lay down my life for Jesus's body and bride, the church, um, and even, you know, celibacy itself, it's meant to be in relationship with Christ, you know, Christ's church as spouse, right? Um, the communal element amplifies all of that in our celebration liturgy. So when I'm doing this in an empty church, I have no doubt that our sacraments are effective, that if people prepare their hearts and minds prayerfully to receive, you know, Christ in spiritual communion, that it's having an impact. When I look at that camera, I have countless, you know, numbers of faces, stories, you know, I know that, 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 that you're out there. Um, so I have you before my eyes when I look at that camera. Um, it, it's, just, you know, that first couple of weeks when I went out there into that empty church and greeted you like, you know, grace, the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Um, you know, it's it, it felt a little odd. It felt heart wrenching, you know, very emotional in a sense. Um, but it does, you know, that this this challenge to engage in spiritual communion does remind me, you know, the people are they're out, you know, you're out there. And I know that we're coming together, even though we're not physically in each other's presence. But all that being said, I very much look forward to the day when we're actually <laughs> together. Yes. <laughs> Me too, Father. Me too. Um, I wanted to ask you about the world that COVID has somewhat forced us to recognize in the sense that we were all brought into this pause. And um, I wanted to know if you could tell me a little bit about what the church is doing, given that COVID has caused such havoc to people personally, not just their health, but to their financial lives and to caring for our um, homeless sisters and brothers. And um, just tell me if what what do you know that the church is doing to help people? And um, yes. Sure. So <clears throat> one that I am that I'm proud and, and happy to say is that um, despite all of the church's struggles, um, despite, you know, or in context of the world's struggles and the church's sins, um, you know, the church has never, has never, the church has always been there on the front lines, you know, in times of, in times of need, where there's where there's disaster, where there's earthquakes, where the people, where the where the, where the poor and the suffering are, the church is there. Um, so through Catholic relief sources, uh, Catholic relief services, Catholic charities, they've ramped up, you know, um, their their presence, their giving, their campaigns. Um, same with you know here in the Archdiocese of Hartford, the Archbishop's annual appeal and what's called the vicariate outreach. I, as a local pastor, can identify communities 
in need or organizations that are that are in need of um, you know food, clothing, resources, that kind of thing, and we can direct them in that way. Okay? So that's the charitable aspect of the church, the charitable service a- a- aspect of the church. We here at St. Thomas More run a soup kitchen throughout the academic year, and when we were closing our doors and stopping everything else, you know, uh, as far as the, the worship aspect thing goes and bringing people together for, um, you know, social gatherings and stuff, we, we continued our soup kitchen. That was something that we were not going to stop. We couldn't stop along with the other soup kitchens here in the city of New Haven. Um, so I'm happy to say that we've, we've kind of borne, we've borne witness to that truth that, you know, Christ does not abandon um, the poor, the suffering, those who are struggling. Um, it challenges us to, to bear witness to that fact and to make sure we have our ministries up and running and to have our ears and heart, both our physical ears and the ears of our hearts open to the cry of poor or those, those who are struggling and the, and the working poor or families who just suddenly have just lost everything because of this, right? Um, and I'm thankful to say that we, can, we, have, we, we have the ability to direct our resources in that direction. That's a charitable aspect, right? Um, and then, and also recognizing the church's the church, the body of Christ is more than just the building, than just the person wearing the uniform. Um, but, you know, we've encouraged those who, who are able to, to actually be on, you know, those who could go where people dared not or, or could not go, you know, like in, you know, the hospitals or the, or the frontline workers, whatever, remind, reminding them that you bear the dignity of, of, of Jesus Christ, the vessel of the living God. So, by our words, by our actions, you know, I have a beautiful article about, you know, the ER doctors and nurses and support staff, the CNAs, conveying compassion, assurance through their eyes, because that's the only thing that is visible to the person in that bed, right? The great power of just our our eyes and what we can do by being present in a different way. Um, one thing the church has been experiencing, I think is a major wake up call that our Holy Father has been, you know, I'm trying to hammer home since he walked in the door. Um, but he said something very powerful that I've referred to his blessing in Vatican Square that, um, you know, we have been we have been going along um, thinking that because we are well and everyone is well, we, we've been going along fooling ourselves into thinking that because we are well, all is well while the world is sick. Yes. You know? And whenever the Holy Father talks about sick or sinfulness, he's talking about not only, you know, moral, physical, spiritual, um, emotional, you know, we can no longer, as you said, we can no longer go along as if we don't need each other. No one achieves salvation alone. He says that we are all in this boat together. It's a shared experience. We can't go along pretending that all is well or that we are well when the world is sick. You know, yes. so that's kind of the perennial wake up call, you know, for us as Christians. And you know what, Father, that's interesting. Um, that approach there reflects his training as a member of the Society of Jesus. St. Ignatius calls us to see God and to love God and to adore God in the image of creation, all of creation. And so um, I, I just wanted to mention that I think that's a theme that St. Francis, I'm sorry, Pope Francis <laughs> is trying to elevate within the consciousness of the church and the world. Um, again, one thing about COVID is it has forced us to reckon with all of the different many faces that people blind themselves to every day, either it be systemic racism, either it be heteronormativity um, or homophobia or just all of the ways in which our brothers and sisters are put down upon. And so I'm I'm just curious, um, as a priest, um, what do you think this leads into our discussion about race. Some are calling this a time of racial reckoning. Um, How, through your ministry, are you um, addressing the issues of race and what issues within this spectrum of race and racism is most compelling for you? And um, what is the role of the church, the Roman Catholic church in particular, um, within that discussion. Sure. Sure. 
Well, I'm glad, I'm glad we went there. But uh, first of all, I can't think of this without having, referring to, you know, um, your statement that you made that I had heard about uh, <laughs> that, that kind of in, uh, finally, you know, struck a chord with me and moved my conscience in such a way. One thing right up front is this examination of conscience, right? We, we make an examination of conscience to, in the light of Jesus Christ, to know our sins and, and then seek reconciliation and restoration justice. Um, I, one of the, I, I understand that at a, at a meeting with the graduate council here at St. Thomas More, um, what was it that you said? You would do, what, you know. I asked, um, why is the Catholic Church, um, something to the effect of why is the Catholic Church so prevalent within the pro-life move Meant, but silent in regards to Black Lives Matter. Yeah. And right. I, oh, oh, no, sorry. Um, and I was curious um, because we had had um, this um, conversation about a theology of life. And so. Right. So it was, and, and it's kind of a fitting conversation too because we're in, in the church right now, we're in October, Respect Life Month, and all the bishops have uh, put out their letters about what it means to be pro life. Um, you know, to recognize and honor the dignity of the human person from conception to natural death. Um, the church has tended to show up in a big, here's just an example. The church has tended to show up in a big way at the March for Life in Washington, D.C. on the anniversary of Roe v. Wade um, in hopes to draw people's attention to uh, the issue of abortion and, and to pray a day of prayer and penance for all of those impacted by abortion, all of those. So um, mothers, fathers, whether they're present or not, the unborn, you know, uh, communities that have been struck, um, in, in, especially by, by this. So the church shows up in, in, in great numbers on Washington, D.C. for that march. This is just an example. And it tends to sometimes, it kind of comes off looking like it's, it's all about the unborn. It's understandable. I mean, we're talking about you know, abortion of the unborn and the rights of the unborn. Um, but sometimes it seems that we kind of stay there and we forget, not forget, or we're not sure what it is, but from conception to natural death, right? Life at every stage. Um, so not only the, so the rights of the unborn, the right of that child born, but then a culture of life, you know, access to education and nutrition assistance programs and taking care of mothers and families and communities, you know, creating and promoting a culture of life, you know, which, which when you think about it, every single issue really at the end of the day is a life issue because yes. it has to do with protecting and the dignity and sanctity of human life and conception natural death, right? So the beginning of life, the end of life, euthanasia, the death penalty, um, but also, you know, how we, how we treat those who are in prison, uh, or our or our enemies, you know, uh, yes. policies on torture a few years ago, right? Um, so it's like it's every single aspect of who we are as uh, in society is is a life issue, and for whatever reason, we I think we struggle as a church to to preach that truth. Um, Pope Francis has been really outspoken about that since the very beginning, and it's not the you know, abortion is not the only issue. It's a huge issue, it's not the only issue. Um, Bishop McElroy, most recently, you know, out on the West Coast, same thing, especially as we go into this election. Um, we cannot be a one issue. We can't be focused on one issue because we'll miss the whole truth and how, and, and you know, right. So here I am going down the rabbit hole. So I kind of give back, 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 back to so, fine, by the way. Um, one thing. So back to that, um, the pro-life march, the march on Washington, you know, the, the uh, March for Life. How is it that we show up big time for that? Where is the church when there's a Black Lives Matter rally? If all lives matter, which has become, you know, kind of come off to be a defensive and offensive remark, all lives matter in response to the imperative Black Lives Matter. Um, in this moment of racial reckoning, when we're looking at these acts of violence, against black people, particularly at the hands of, of law enforcement officers. Um, you know, this moment of racial reckoning is causing all of us to be like, okay, you know, yes, all lives matter, but clearly 
we're missing the point, this important part of the human family, this important party of the, uh, this important part of the whole body of the human family is, is suffering, is, is, you know, getting violently attacked. It needs our, it needs our attention. You know, one of the analogies is like, if your arm is, you know, hanging by a thread and you say, gosh, I need some help for this, or this needs attention. And then so he's like, well, your whole body counts. Your whole body is what matters. It's like, yeah. Yes. <laughs> right. <laughs> so taking seriously the imperative that Black Lives Matter has to, that is probably the most important life issue facing us at this moment. One of the most important issues. You know, this this summer of racial reckoning, right, has reminded has has shown us that that this, this is a major life issue. And if we are pro-life, we need to show up. Um, we need to show up. We need, we, you know, with our voices, with our bodies, alongside our brothers and sisters in response to Jesus' call. You know, the, the, the law, and love of God, and love of neighbor. Um, yes. These are our neighbors. These are our brothers and sisters. Vessels of the living God. We need to be with them, hear their voices, and and, and be ready to march alongside them um, and seek seek change. Um, so yeah, kind of long, maybe long digression here, but when I, it was, the, it was in the days after the killing of George Floyd, when I was reminded of your, your, your remark that day at, at the grad council, you know, if we are pro-life, why aren't we showing up for Black Lives Matter the way we do for the March for Life or something like that, or, or if we really believe in the sanctity of human life, where, why is the church not showing up? And as we've all been called to make a good examination of conscience on this whole thing. I was struck, my conscience, wow, I've preached on life, written on life, you know, have I made a statement in the pulpit, in my writings about this issue of systemic racism, um, made the statement Black Lives Matter? Have I, have I shown up? Um, I felt called to basically, I've got to show up. I think the end, the, I, the end of my homily that day was, maybe I have to show up to that march. And <laughs> four days later, we, you know, in, in this summer, we had this major demonstration on the green and I'm like, it's like, I better show up, you know? Um, yes. And, and for me, it was one of the most important uh, moments in my ministry to go and stand in solidarity with 5,000 others in this peaceful, um, powerful march, you know, calling, calling the world manifestation here in this local community um, attention to this issue and be ready to take a stand and work for change. Um, so we, how do we, so we've, we've preached on it, we've written on it, we've studied. Church is really good on studying, you know, yes. <laughs> you know <laughs> we're reading the sources, we're, we're wanting to listen. The next piece of this, you know, is, as it says in the bishop's document, open wide our hearts from the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops, open wide our hearts, the enduring call to love, a pastoral letter against racism. Talks about, um, the, the issues of the, the experience of Native Americans, Hispanics, and particularly Black people in this country. Um, and it calls for, it, it points out right up front that justice, that the, the original definition, the re original understanding of justice requires first an honest acknowledgement of our sins and our failings. So examination of conscience, acknowledge our sins, name them, you know, seek forgiveness and work for reconciliation. Working for reconciliation requires restoring right relationship with God and our neighbor. And that's, that's where justice is. You can't have just forgiveness and reconciliation without justice. Um, and that requires action. Um, so not, you know, so studying is great, praying is great, listening is great, having a special liturgy, preaching a homily, um, but sooner or later, we've got our, our actions have to, you know, follow our words, right? Walk, walk the talk. And, you know, Father Ryan, I'm so happy to see you emphasize the word action. Um, love within our tradition, as defined by St. Augustine, states that we are to will the good of the other as the other person. That means that we are called to... Um, step outside of our own privilege, our own location, and to hear sincerely the needs of our brothers and sisters. 
And when I made that statement at the council, I was um, more interested in, again, getting to what you said, that the church is great about writing letters and studying, but what is the practical movement? What is the practical response of the church? Again, um, as a young person and as a Black person within our church, I understand more deeply what Francis means when he's calling for a poor church for this movement to love and adore God and all of creation. And in the action of loving all of creation, that calls us to march with our feet and to knock on doors and to, um, again, move outside of our own comfortable space. Um, and to see God and to find God in a face that we don't, that we aren't quite familiar with or we don't know. And I think on behalf of the Archdiocese of Hartford, you actually got to the letter that I was going to ask you about. What is the significance of that letter for the Archdiocese? What is the significance of that letter for you and the meaning of your ministry? Sure. So, sure. you know, so. It, the Open Wide Our Hearts, The Enduring Call to Love, A Pastoral Letter Against Racism. This comes from the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops. Um, it was written in 2018. I believe it was updated a bit and then put forth by the bishops as, you know, basically sending this, look, we've, we've written on this. We, we need to, this issue is not going away. Um, it, it's meant to draw, wake us up, draw our attention to the issue at hand. Um, and the, the historical experience of, 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 of people of color in our country and the church's role in this. You know, at one point, it talks about, even all the way back, Pope Nicholas V in the 15th century. It was his letter and his support that, that allowed for the transatlantic slave trade. Yes. Right? So, you know, and, and that's in the experience of, of the church in this country, all kinds of Christian denominations, but the Roman Catholic Church as well, our role in, in um, perpetuating the evil of, of systemic racism and violence uh, against people of color, particularly black people. Um, so the first thing is understanding that nobody gets to think this doesn't apply to them or sit, sit this out. It's meant to be a wake up call. Every single one of us needs to make that examination of conscience. Every single one of us needs to acknowledge the, 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 the presence, the possible presence of not only prejudice, but, but racism, bigotry, hatred, you know, that dwells in the depths of the hearts, in, in, in people's hearts because of the broken condition, the presence of evil. Um, our, one thing that they say in the opening lines is that um, racism often comes in the form of a sin of omission. Mm. You know, there are sins that we commit and there are sins of omission in which an evil is taking place in our midst, impacting our neighbors, our brothers and sisters. And we either ignore it, you know, the, the kind of willful ignorance, um, pretend it's not there or, or acknowledge it. And then just think, well, it's not my problem. It's not impacting me or my family or my community. I'm going to leave it alone. I'll hope somebody else handles it, that kind of thing. Um, so it's calling our attention right up front to the evil of racism and that we all have a part to either perpetuating that evil or doing something about it. A lot of the document, you know, is, is about creating awareness and in light of the dignity of the human person and our call to be the presence of Christ's love and action in the world. Where I struggle with it, it towards the end, it does make some suggestions. Um, and in some ways it's, it's, you know, and, and good, good suggestions, you know, um, Work with your local uh, the local authorities, you know, your civic leaders, you know, write your legislators, knock on doors, um, you know, partner with with those who are working with around this. So what we've done here at St. Thomas More is we're partnering with a group called Connect, Congregations Organized for a New Connecticut, which is interfaith Christian, Christian leaders basically identifying issues and then taking concrete steps to either advocate for various, you know, groups of underprivileged or, or disenfranchised or victims of, it inju of injustice. Um, some of it's political advocacy, some of it's, you know, kind of connecting people with the resources that they need. 
um, you know, and showing up and taking responsibility for it. That's a big part of this is taking responsibility for it. Not just saying, oh, that's a problem, isn't that sad? But taking responsibility for it. Um, also just kind of creating relationships with other, with, with, with the communities themselves and leaders themselves. So the parish, you know, St. Martin, St. Martin of Porres, you know, um, the, the historically black church here in the neighborhood, you know, reaching out to that, to that community. And what can we do to, to support you or learn from you? You know, um, a lot of this too is identifying yourself with leaders of the movement and being willing to be a humble participant, you know, yes. in the movement. we can't walk in with this kind of triumphalistic, you know, very white tendency to be like, let us show you how to, you know, yes, um, how to do this thing. Um, being willing to learn humbly from others. I got to say where we struggle and that maybe this is a very, so to the point earlier about all lives, you know, or, or the March for Life or pro-life versus Black Lives Matter, not versus, but how we respond to these, these issues. Pro-life, you know, the March for Life, that's just one thing. Year round. You know, there are campaigns. We're in the 40 Days for Life right now. Um, you know, faithful citizenship, it's going to draw our attention to that issue in a major way. Um, there's no shortage of concrete steps that we ought to be, you know, our, our leaders remind us that we ought to be doing in regards to pro-life, particularly how, it, how that call impacts the unborn. Um, but I think we're, we struggle to find concrete steps to respond to this issue. And I'm not sure why that is. It may be kind of, it may be, um, it may be about fear. Um, it may be um, stepping into a realm that we're not totally comfortable with or, or we've not been the leaders about. It may be having to face the ugly truth of, of all of our kind of role in this, you know, um, yes. for good or for evil. Um, getting through that, getting past that is a challenge, right? Um, yes. But you know, as always, you know, Jesus tells us, do not be afraid. You know, Christ is, has to be present. You know, Christ is present. We as the body of Christ, as Christ's eyes, feet, hands, whatever, we need to be where, you know, where, where the issue is. Um, and you know what, Father, I, I agree with you and I appreciate your honesty. Um, and I think the church is on the road of recognizing its place within constructing a world where the reduction and the commodification of black life um, was made. And I believe that um, through our recognition of sins, of the sin of racism in particularly, we, um, not just through our writings, but with the new movement of priests and other people within our church um, bearing witness to that particular sin and their willingness to participate is just a step and a long road of repentance and just reconciliation. Um, one thing about the Catholic church that kind of drew me to it was the fact that I knew my place in it before anyone ever told me my place in it. The Church of Christ belongs to all of us, not just some of us, all of us. And if people, even if people do not recognize certain communities are what have you, we know that God calls us to join his church. Um, I want to say that it was a cardinal in Rome that said that we're all miserable people that Jesus has called to create a glorious church. Um, we're all sinful people called to participate within a beautiful, with, within the beautiful life of Christ. So I really do appreciate you kind of speaking to that and to creating a patchwork of that. And we have a little bit of time left. So I was going to ask you, um, granted, this is no big question, right? What, what does the church, what does leadership in the church look forward to post COVID? after recognizing all of the systemic realities that we find clashing within our just everyday experiences? Well, I think one of the big, one of the big things, you know, and, and it's funny, I was just with the, you know, it's a chance that I'm still part of the Archbishop's cabinet. And we talked about, um, you know, really the systemic racism issue and, and the concrete steps and things like that. You know, th there is this real concern, and I think it's a good one that this isn't going to be a kind of a one and done thing. You know, a letter has been written. We preached something. We showed up at a march. Um, 
you know, just as we have realized those things that we have taken for granted, um, that idea of persisting as if all is well in a, in, a, in a world that is sick, I think the hope is that when we come out of the pandemic, just as we're going to be so super grateful and joyfully, you know, back in the presence of our brothers and sisters, you know, at worship and receiving Christ in the sacraments, um, realizing the intense gift and, and that, that Christ's love present in the, in, in the community is, I think that it will be something that, please God, we won't have, we won't lose sight of again. Um, and that with these, with the issues that have been raised throughout this, <laughs> this again, this glorious 2020th year of our Lord, <laughs> uh, that this will be something that makes us, that, that makes us, makes the world in the grand scheme and it's hard to believe right now where when we're in the middle of, you know, where there's so much tension and so much struggle right now, um, that we will come through this, you know, kinder, humbler, more holy, more heroic, um, more loving. You know, the body of Christ is, is one that is, you know, riddled with, with wounds and is bleeding, you know, and it's also yes. glorious, right? At, to the point of that cardinal's, that, that cardinal statement. Um, you know, so I think that, I, I, well, I can't speak for all leaders in the church. My my vision is that we will come come through this, you know, like I said, holier and holier, humbler, kinder, more loving, heroic, unafraid. Um, that the lessons that we are learning, not, I'm not going to say we have learned because we are. This is going to. There's a long road, right? Um, yes. We see people who are who are fearless, you know, um, showing up you know, ready to, ready to be, to die and rise with Christ, you know, with and for our neighbors, our brothers and sisters, you know, um, and whatever, whatever that looks like. Great. Um, thank you so much, Father Ryan, for giving us the time to speak. Um, just know that with priests like you leading, leading the way and helping and speaking with young people like like me, I just know that you are helping create a space where all of us feel comfortable and welcomed and loved within the church. So thank you again for the gift of your priesthood. And um, I can't wait to come back to St. Thomas More and hear one of your masses. So, And thanks be to God for, 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 for all of this. Um, and for what you're doing, uh, both as a student and your vocation, continuing to recognize God's presence in your life and and, uh, and creating the space to, to be able to talk candidly um, through the lens of faith and, and for your challenges as well. I, re I, I really enjoy our, our, our chats and I look forward to continuing in the future. Great, cool. Thank you so, so much again, Father. Um, yeah, can't, can't wait to speak with you again. Right on. Awesome. Thank you.